Ladies, so I see elements of the 45th, the 84th. Um, there's some green jackets out there. Those would have been belonged to Butler's Rangers, American Loyalist Organization, Americans who were fighting for the crown. John Adams politely said that one third were for the British, one third didn't care who was around, and one third fought for the Americans. In reality, it being an American Civil War in the truest sense, most Americans joined whatever side the army. <laughs> the soldiers are using muzzle loading weapons with a flint lock ignition. And weather plays a major uh, reliability factor in their weaponry, whether it'll go off or not. A very humid day like today makes the musket not necessarily respond correctly. Muzzle loading weapons, the soldier was supposed to train that he could do four rounds a minute on the drill field so that he could probably get two rounds a minute off in combat. Despite what you've learned in your history book, marksmanship did count. However, the range of the weapon was short. Both sides shot at marks at 50 yards. A mark was a one foot square target. If they hit it reliably, at least in the British Army, he got a little extra pay or an extra ration of rum. On the far side, the Illinois Regiment of Virginia is marching on the field. This was raised by George Rogers Clark. The ones that are in the blue uniform and white facings is the actual uniform that the regiment finally got in 1780. The 170 five men that he took Fort Sackville, the ground you're standing on, primarily showed up without uniforms, to the point that some people described them as naked. Despite the fact that they are lined up in line, the concentration of forces was limited. This was an opportunity for them to push their firepower and press an opposition. Most of the time, the American terrain did not allow for European tactics, and both sides, both British and American, were notoriously known for every finding every fence, tree, rock, house, or anything else they could hide behind and spring up and run to a point on command. <laughs> the Americans seem to be wanting to push the issue so they've consolidated their forces. We find, we see, find ourselves on a bit of a stalemate here. Both sides trying to find the flank, and push the other one off the field. <laughs> You'll also notice that some of the units have dropped their coats, which was standard practice in the, the heat of the day. 
One of the things that the European armies found when they came to America is it's hot here. Europe at that time was still ending an ice age, so it was quite cool. And that ice age is what was the reason for the American fur trade. You'll also notice there's, you'll see some red-coated troops out there in trousers with bonnets. That's the 71st Fraser's Highlanders. Even though they're Highlanders, one of the things they did not like about America was it was hot and there was something called poison ivy. The 42nd Highlanders are the ones in the grenadier helmets with the bonnets, or with the grenadier helmets and their kilts. That would be the full formal wear of any Highland regiment. All Highland regiments modeled themselves off the 42nd. But the British Army was a practical army and one in America. Meet the conditions, change the uniform. Another set of American militia have decided to join the battle. Militia troops were generally local troops raised by either side to help augment their regular forces. Very useful in uh, work details for building entrenchments and things like that, but they were not notoriously known for being poor, reliable soldiers. What their value was was knowing the terrain and adding a labor force as needed. Americans appear to be taking some serious casualties and the, the fire is slacking off. Ammunition was always a problem for both George Rogers Clark at the far end of a very long logistics tale as well as the British Army. We think of today Iron Mountains and when we talk armies, lots and lots of supplies, but this was a very far flung frontier and getting supplies here was very difficult. And one of the other things that you'll pay attention to is that there's ladies on the field. As reenactors, we use these ladies as safety officers because among other things, it's a nice hot day and they're bringing water to us. But in reality, they served a major function for the armies of the 18th century. The British Army formalized them, whereas the American Army wasn't thrilled that they're there because they ate rations. But the British planned for them and both armies used them. The ladies had a mission in the army. If they were married to a soldier, they were on the ration. And as on the ration, they had a job. For the British Army, they were one half of the Transportation Corps, one half of the Quartermaster Corps, the entire Nurse Corps of the British Army. Not only did they support the Army, they were involved in washing the men's clothes to make sure that they were healthy. They were working in the hospital for which they got paid. They got paid doing the laundry. But in the British Army, they were not allowed to cook the food. It was afraid that they would steal the rations from the men. It appears the militia are falling back and leaving the flank open, and the British are taking advantage of it. It's not looking too good for the American main body. The British Grenadiers in particular 
and the 42nd Grenadiers with their tall hats are an impressive sight. And the Americans did not like to fight a bayonet battle, so when the British would come at them with a bayonet, they tended to melt away. It's better to live and fight another day. Another disadvantage the British had was they could not really afford casualties st strategically because their manpower replacement did not come from the United States. Their manpower replacement came from England, which was a 3,000 six-week, 3,000 mile or six-week voyage just to get one replacement. You also notice that there's a bagpiper on the field. The Grenadier Company of the Highland Regiments was allowed a bagpiper. That was a concession to raising Highland Regiments because after the Battle of Culloden in 1745, the bagpipe was an illegal instrument until that time. There are some that still think it's an illegal instrument. The troops moving forward on the British side are Brunswick Germans. There is a tendency in your history books to call all Germans Hessians because most of the German hired troops came from Hasse Kessel in Germany. Darmstadt is the major city there. However, there were Ansbachers and Brunswickers as well as from the Landgrave of Hasse Kessel or Hessians has supplied the British Army with troops. These troops did not see the money per se that the British Crown paid their prince, but they were very useful to the British Army here in America. They were professional soldiers. And part of their bad reputation was, in the 18th century, a professional soldier, if he won the battle, was allowed to loot the battlefield. That didn't go down too well with American propagandists. The 18th century instrument of terror has been applied by the right flank with the bayonets. <laughs> the Americans are retiring from the field. The American commander is apparently trying to save what he can of his soldiers. As he's meeting with the British commander in hopes that his troops can get away. By the rules of 18th century warfare, this army that stayed on the field at the end of the battle was the victor. It appears that the British army is the victor of this afternoon's skirmish as they are in control of the field.
The gentlemen have come to an agreement. And the Americans have retired from the field. As the British would at the end of a battle, say of three cheers to the crown, God save the king. To you, the our crowd, we say thank you very much for attending. And we look forward to seeing you.